Get my shoes and out the door. Five, I'm alive. Six, seven, eight, feeling great. Hello and welcome back to Beyond Your Wildest Genes podcast. My name is Dr. Noah DeCoyer and I'm your co-host. Today our guest is Dr. David Seaman, the author of The Deflame Diet, Deflame Your Diet, Body, and Mind. Dr. Seaman received a BS in bio- Biology and Nutrition at Rutgers, then went to New York Chiropractic College. Shortly after graduating, 30 years ago now, he took classes that delved more deeply into pain mechanisms and realized that food Related chemicals cause inflammation and stimulate pain fibers, nociceptors. Dr. Seaman has written two books and many articles and book chapters on the topic of nutrition for pain and inflammation. He has taught this topic in several chiropractic college programs, including Palmer, National, and Logan. His most recent book is The Deflame Diet, which was published in April of 2016. Thank you, Dr. Seaman, for your time today. We really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Listen, Dr. Seaman, you've been talking about inflammation and deflaming for years. Uh, the first time I realized it, and it's a magazine cover that we use all the time in our lectures, was the February 23rd, 2004 Time magazine cover, and the headline was Inflammation, the Sign Killer. Uh, thoughts on this? Yeah, uh, that really kind of captured the the issue, but then when they get into it, in that in that book, or rather in that article, and in lots of other articles, uh, they'll, they'll typically skirt around the real the real big hairy elephant gorilla in the middle of the room, and that is overeating sugar, flour, and the refined oils that sugar and flour are cooked in. And they get on to uh, this like take fish oil, which is fine, uh, do this, do that, but it's kind of a it. it any of those therapies are less effective if you're flaming away with, you know, biting too many donuts and donut-like foods. But other than that, though, they were right on the money. And what people really should have taken from that is that Alzheimer's disease is basically uh, atherosclerosis of the brain. Diabetes is Alzheimer's disease of the pancreas. Osteoarthritis is atherosclerosis of joints, and we can kind of go on and on because the chemistry of all these diseases are essentially identical, the difference being the, the, the parenchymal or structural tissues that the diseases occur in. So that's really the difference. So it can kind of like confuse what one should do for one disease versus the other because the names are different and the tissues are different in terms of anatomy, but the biochemistry is virtually identical in all of those conditions. Yeah, we're going to dive into that in one second, but just to set the stage and just for our audience to get a feel of who you are, how did you get into this topic? Because you're trained as a chiropractor, and, and you know, first of all, chiropractors start off being trained in you know structure equals function, and then you know we branch off into different topics and different specialties. Uh, how did you end up here and where you are today? Um, well. My undergraduate degree was in biology slash nutrition, and I went through all all the chemistry stuff, uh, you know, biochemical pathways and Krebs cycle and uh, and glycolysis numerous times, memorizing from glucose down to ATP numerous times, and uh, lipids got into the Krebs cycle, making ATP numerous times. And when I was in college, the biochem book that I used showed that there were nutrients that were were required to drive these pathways. And then when I got into chiropractic college, um, I, I became a fan of, 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 of trigger point therapy. And my favorite book, and it's still a favorite of mine in terms of historical significance for me, was Janet Travell and David Simon's book on trigger points. And they have a perpetuation chapter. And that perpetuation chapter, half of it, is about nutrition. And so I started to look at this, nutrition and f- and, and, and muscle pain. So that kind of treated me when I was in chiropractic college. And then shortly after graduating, I uh, took a postgrad class that was taught by a fairly famous, deceased now, British medical doctor whose career was basically looking at joint pain, joint neurology, artic- articular neurology. And he was a friend to uh, physical therapists, manual therapists of all kind, be they physiotherapists, massage therapists, historical bone setters or chiropractors, and his name is Dr. Barry Wyke, W-Y-K-E-E, W-Y-K-E, not to be confused with Barry White, the Allie McBeal singer dude. So 
I, <laughs> so I took this class with him like, I don't know, maybe a year after I graduated. So that's like almost 30 years ago. And he went over the, 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 uh, the pain system in a fashion where I could actually sit back and not have to worry about a test or the next, ne the next hour going to a different class or whatever it might be. And I sat there for 12 or 15 hours and, and, and he basically made it very, very clear that our body chemistry is perhaps the most profound influencer of our pain systems activity and its stimulation. And that really kind of got me going and I started to look at nutrition from the perspective of its ability to produce the chemicals that Dr. White laid out. And that was back in like 1987 or so. So I've been doing this and hunting for information for 30 years now. So when I, when I read that article, uh, in, 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 in Time Magazine and some of the other books that came out uh, about inflammation and diet. I'm like, geez, you know, I should have got this book out earlier. I mean, I was, teach, <laughs> te I was teaching post-grad classes to Kairos on this topic in 1992, and I didn't get my book out until 2016. I, you know, I'm a little bit late to the, to the show, even though I was there in the beginning. <laughs> uh, better late than never. So That's let's, true. Let's, let's, let's go there. How about starting uh, this conversation with the difference between acute inflammation versus chronic inflammation? Because uh, they both have their importances, uh, but I, I don't know if everybody real un uh, really understands the difference between both of those types. Well, when you, when you take a biology class or a physiology class, the topic is of, of, of inflammation and discuss, and is, is discuss, and it's always described in the context of a post-injury chemical response that involves swelling, redness, heat, and pain. And, and, to ha and that response is required for healing to occur. And that's all absolutely true. The problem is when inflammation is, 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 is quiet, and it's typically called, in the, kinds of, and it, it, the, the term chronic is usually used for the, the quiet version, where there is no swelling, there is no redness, there is no heat, there's no identifiable presence of inflammation. And that is what takes place within vessel walls for heart disease and in the pancreas for type 2 diabetes and even in tendons for tendinopathy and joints for osteoarthritis. It's a, it's a more silent kind of quiet version until enough tissue has been damaged so as to bring out symptoms. And it's, the symptoms are typically brought out in a fashion that does not alert us to the previous 10, 20, 30 years of self-abuse in a, in, a, in a moderate fashion, as we call it. Well, I only smoke a little bit. I, don't, I only eat a couple of donuts a day. I haven't exercised in five years, but I walk a little bit. All those things are pro-inflammatory. Over time, they manifest in this chronic state that then is associated with chronic disease expression. So one is quiet and silent until it expresses itself, and the other is robust and obvious after a, a, a typical injury. And the chronic version is, 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 is the one associated with diet, even though, interestingly, even though if you eat a donut, your body will undergo an acute response, an inflammatory response to the food, but it will be silent to your symptoms. So it's really kind of a paradoxical situation. Interesting. And before we really dive into diet, um, how does inflammation, because I know this is where you really studied, uh, particularly in your early years, how does inflammation relate to pain? Well, when you think about uh, the neurology of pain, and, and, and most practitioners, and this involves whether it would be a chiropractor or a, a uh, a medical doctor, osteopath, physical therapist, it really doesn't make any difference. We all learn basic pain mechanisms from a physiology book. And physiology books, they don't really get into the, the detail of how these pain fibers, or properly called nociceptors, are stimulated. So the way it works is, for example, um, prostaglandins are... Are, are probably one of the better known inflammatory chemicals. And for the listening audience who says, I'm not sure what a prostaglandin is, people take aspirin, Tylenol, uh, Aleve, Motrin, Celebrex. People take those medications to, to, to turn off the production of prostaglandins. Now, the way prostaglandins cause pain is they stimulate a specific prostaglandin receptor on the pain fiber. 
And so if we didn't have prostaglandin receptors, we wouldn't have pain from prostaglandins, but we'd have pain from other chemicals. Now, the problem with prostaglandins is that their balance of production in the body is dependent on the types of fats that we eat. And this is where people you know, are, have, have, have an urge to consume fish oil, for example, because fish oil is anti-inflammatory, and one of the beneficial effects of fish oil is a reduction of this pro-inflammatory pain stimulating prostaglandin and, uh, and instead a, a greater production of an anti-inflammatory non-pain stimulating prostaglandin. Gotcha. Perfect. So that's a perfect segue into food. Um, what are some examples of how diet can promote inflammation or that chronic or that silent inflammation in your body? Well, let's just say that somebody decides that they're going to avoid eating vegetables and eat and and eat sugar, flour, refined oils, and then, well, I mean, after, well, let's look at. I guess another way to look at it would be what does the average American eat? About maybe ten percent of their calories comes from vegetables, fruit, nuts, and beans. And whole grains are the least healthy of your whole foods. the The lion's share of calories in the average American's diet is comes from sugar, flour, and refined oils, and about 10% from milk, and eh, maybe 15, 20% from meat. So the average person just eats basically meat and bread and pasta and sugar, flour, desserts and donuts and those types of things. So when we eat those foods, there is an immediate inflammatory reaction that occurs. When you're young, you don't feel anything. Uh, and when you're young and when you're busy running around, you don't get any weight gain. And then when people continue to eat that way in college, and now in college they're sitting a lot more because they're in class and then they study and then they're, at night they're studying, they're eating, and so they're spending a lot more time being sedentary, eating the same amount of calories and the same foods, they start to put on body fat. And the accumulation of body fat from those calorie sources is, a, is the easiest way to identify that one is flaming up, as I call it. So body fat gain is a manifestation of low-grade inflammation developing. So that is one example, and the average person in America, well, if you, one out of three Americans is normal weight, and two out of three are either overweight or obese, which means that two-thirds of the adult population, and now kids, of course, are heavy too, uh, so two-thirds of the, uh, the adult population are inflamed from the perspective of body weight. Now, when they're eating these calorie sources, and I call them calorie sources rather than food because sugar, flour, and refined oils, that's not food. Food is stuff that is living uh, either on the ground, running around in the woods, or grazing, or is growing in the ground, or swimming in the, swimming in the ocean. That's food. Sugar and flour, not growing. <laughs> Not food. So, so, so when we eat these calorie sources, there is a uh, our our the bacteria in our intestines reacts to the sugar, flour, and refined oil and, and refined oils to create a low grade inflammatory reaction in the gut, and that low grade inflammatory reaction in the gut is transferred due to the fact that the sugar, flour, as well as bacterial end products are absorbed into circulation, and so you get a low grade inflammatory reaction. Every time we eat, the, we eat those foods, when we overeat those foods, we gain weight. And so when it goes, goes on over time, over time, over time, the sugar and flour will drive the inflammation. And then eating too much omega-6 fatty acids from the refined oils as in deep fried food, that will change the, the anatomy of our cell membranes and make them pro-inflammatory so that now our cells in our body, all the ones that are produced uh, after we get into this overeating inflammatory food state, all the cells in our body then take on a, a, a molecular signature, a molecular anatomy of, of inflammation. And this goes on over time, and then eventually we start not to feel well. Like, eh, you know, I'm, like a, I'm a little fatigued, I'm achy, I'm tired, a little depressed. All of those symptoms, which are very common in you know, young adults, is, is, is a manifestation of chronic inflammation. It's due to overeating sugar, flour, refined oils, and not eating f vegetables, fruits, tubers like sweet potatoes, nuts, and legumes. You know, Dr. Seaman, at first glance, you know, it's in your book, and it, it, 
at first glance, it astounded, and the percentage astounded me. Uh, you said 60% of the American diet is flour, sugar, and refined. And it, it seems kind of astounding, but then when you think about what the average person eats, an average person wakes up, has a cup of coffee with milk and sugar and a bagel. For lunch, they have a, a sandwich with some cheese and some cold cuts. And if for dinner, they have pasta and garlic bread, right? Like that's, that's the there average. There you go. And dessert. Yeah. And, and you dessert. have a dessert in there, yeah. Right. And, and that, that's and a soda. little bit. Of, and, yeah, and, soda. and don't forget oh, soda. And if you're in the South, you got sweet tea. Mm-hmm. So, 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 so the average American eats about 100 plus pounds of sugar a year. Right. So at first glance, like I said, it, it looks a lot, but then then you realize that it's it's not a lot. It's it's what everybody's doing. And then when you really look at all the biochemical processes, like you said, like your cell membranes literally becoming transformed because of this, uh, you can understand why we're such an obese, sick, unhealthy nation and getting sicker, by the way. And to be fair, I also in, in the book I mentioned that is more about it's like about fifty six percent or fifty five point six or fifty seven percent, not sixty percent based upon one assessment. But I just rounded up to sixty because it's easier to to remember. And because you and I aren't doing that, some guy out there is doing seventy percent or eighty percent to make up for us. I know that's that's the that's that's scary. <laughs> yeah, that's, it is scary. Let's hit this. Uh, what foods inflame and which foods uh, deflame? Well, in my the chart of foods that deflame, people will see things like bacon and cream cheese and cream and heavy cream. And think, How could that be? Well, you can't just drink heavy cream. But the point is, if you're eating veg- vegetables, uh, those those fatty foods are really irrelevant in the context of driving inflammation. Uh, people will think, well, you know, meat is a bad thing, right? People will ask probably you and certainly me, do you eat meat? You know, like as if meat is bad. The reason why is because when, when, when you look at a, a burger, you usually see it covered with dripping, with dripping with, 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 with cheese and a big bun and then French fries everywhere. And people will blame the burger and give the the bun and the extra fries and the Coke and the shake and the apple thing afterwards that's full of sugar, you know, the apple pie thing. And they don't they don't criticize that, but the those all get the pass, but the meat gets criticized. So it's not so much what the you know, which foods actually do it. It is it is it's better to look at it in the context of which foods lead to a post eating surge of sugar associated with fat and the biggest issue is 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 sugar so it's really sugar and flour do this so if you decide to put again a big old burger on top of a donut well you're kind of adding fat and protein to sugar flour and fat and that and, and in that context the added calories becomes a problem so really it's about calories if one overeats calories, they will gain weight. Now, the, the key is that I could eat pounds and pounds of cheese and become obese and inflamed. So one has to control their calories first. And the easiest way to control calories is to, you know, overeat, in quotes, overeat vegetables. Like a head of romaine lettuce is 100 calories. The average person, you know, looks at a, a small side salad as, you know, eating eating vegetables. And that's like maybe three leaves for two leaves from a head of romaine lettuce and represents about maybe 10 calories, 20 calories. So one has to eat several hundred calories per day of vegetation. So that needs to be the way to look at it, overeating vegetation from one's current eating pattern. And that means eating pounds of vegetation per day. I'll I'll often eat two pounds of broccoli in one sitting. People, that's a lot. Not really. Two pounds of broccoli is like 225 calories, 250 calories. So one has to overeat vegetables and then taking calories from potatoes and nuts. And if you do that, you're kind of stuffed and there's no way you're going to drink a gallon of heavy cream or eat a pound or two of cheese. So the, the foundation should be vegetation upon which, to which we add our animal products. I think that's probably the best way to look at it rather than picking out which food will inflame me, which food will deflame me, because it has to be taken in the context of overall of overall calorie intake. 
Yeah, I had a, a little bit of a hard time looking at that too. I'm I'm a I eat essentially paleo slash primal. Uh, I've done that for nearly five years. Um, I had a hard time looking at the calories thing for a while, and then I finally realized that the the, the way my one works is the bulk has to be vet, vegetables or vegetation. Ultimately, the ca- the bulk of the calories are probably going to c- come from healthy fats because just calorie wise, that's just the way it is. A tablespoon of Fat is like 200 calories. And like you said, you need to eat two pounds of broccoli to get 200 calories. And Isn't that that's, crazy? Isn't that crazy? It's insane to me, but that's the way I had to look at it to really under, understand this. Because you, 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 could, you could essentially, it's almost impossible to eat 2,000 calories of <laughs> vegetables a day. It would be a hell of a lot of vegetables, that's for sure. You, yeah, you, you cannot do it. And so the biggest hurdle for people to overcome and the paleo diet issue is a problem for people too because because people misinterpret paleo. For example, I'll just do just a real quick quick bit on that. Paleo is based of, is, is is historical eating based upon the foods that were available in your local environment. Right. So if, so if I was from Florida, my paleo diet in Florida back in uh, 1700 would be very different than my paleo diet in Saskatchewan in 1700. Because because different animals and different vegetation grows in these very, very different locations. It gets even more crazy if you think about the Arctic Circle, where the primary calorie source would be seal meat, like 80% fat. And you go down to New Guinea, where they have equally virtually no chronic diseases. And there, their primary calories are sweet potatoes, taro, uh, yams, and fruit. And they're free of disease. So paleo is really eating what is local to your your own your own environment but now what people have done is they think well fat is bad and uh fruit people are now afraid of fruit like oh fructose oh fruit's bad and they just don't eat enough calories and they mostly eat protein and then they feel terrible eating paleo (laughs) because because they get duped by all the other crazy uh fear mongering water muddy water muddying things that are out there regarding fructose and and fat. So yeah, your absolutely your approach is 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 smart to be paleo and primal. Uh, the thing about the paleo primal movement is that there should not be fat fear placed upon people because because fat eating fat is not a problem. Every study where people eat uh, eat at, at their caloric needs or in slight deficit but go into ketosis by eating lots of fat and virtually no sugar, no flour, and very low low starchy carbohydrates. The outcome is health benefits across the board, endurance, no loss in endurance, no loss in strength. And so the whole fat thing needs to be really better understood by the average person out there. Yeah, and it's in your book, and, and you, you, you mentioned it already. It's fat is, healthy fats are not the problem. They're only a problem in the context of excess omega-6 seed oils, in the context of <clears throat> excessive sugar, or and in the context of excessive flour and wheat products yeah even saturated fats people are terrified of saturated fats and and i always and in the book i i I wrote it this way because this is how i ask it in lectures whether i'm talking to it doesn't make a difference I've, i've i've done a lot of presentations this this year to dental groups and 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 a couple of medical groups last year and like let's name some saturated fatty acids that are problematic and virtually you know we're so stupefied and live in fear of saturated fats no one can even mention like one like well let's, let's name a fatty acid and, and so they're like well butter like well butter is a is a is a fat and it's made up of fatty acids well animal fat well animal fats animal fat name some saturated fatty acids that are going to kill you and, and people just can't name any because saturated fatty acids in actual fact uh are actually anti-inflammatory like 50 percent roughly of the fat in mother's milk is saturated. So if saturated fat is so bad. How come uh, newborns are being fe- are, are are being fed a big dose of saturated fatty acids? And the reason why is because saturated fatty acids actually have profound antibacterial effects. <laughs> so, so the whole thing is just is a disaster. The way the way fat has been uh, described uh, to 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 the modern population. I, I personally think that alone has been the biggest dietary transgression that's been placed on the public, personally. Um, 
when, when you've touched upon this already, every cell membrane in our body is made of fat. Mother's milk is all fat. Our brain is, what, 60% DHA. I mean, it's, it's just, it's so crucial. And yet the low-fat diet was just slammed down our throats. And finally, we're seeing a turn uh, where people are realizing that was just wrong, just t- wrong in every which way. Yeah, very much wrong. Now, the only way it's right is if you is if you throw a bunch of butter, like a whole tub of butter, on top of some white bread, or a right. whole tub of or, or a whole tub of butter on top of a burger. Well, then it's because now you have too many calories, and too many calories are a problem no matter what your calorie source is. If you could actually eat five thousand calories. Of, 5,000 calories per day of romaine lettuce, that would make you sick because there is a calorie limit, but no one can do that with vegetation. Right. Now, your book is heavy, heavy on, on you know, eating whole foods to achieve this deflamed state. And it's also uh, not disease specific. You clearly say that, that your goal should be to reach this deflamed state consistently and persistently because that's going to limit your chances of all the diseases. But you you do talk about specific supplementation to help support this action of deflaming. Uh, you, you care to list a few of those? Yeah, it's it's, it's very simple actually. It's kind of funny because, because people always want. Well, I have X Y Z. What do I need to take for X Y Z? And to me, X Y Z is just a different name for a, a a condition associated with a particular tissue that happens to be almost identical. The other tissues only, they just do different overall functions, but, but their biologic needs are the same. So that boils down to a multivitamin, magnesium, fish oil, vitamin D as, as the basics. And to, to that, you can add a probiotic. And if the average person just did those five, you can do more, of course. And if one wanted to do more, then the next two that, that the one should move toward would be uh, CoQ10 or lipoic acid. They have similar functions. And then spices like ginger and turmeric and boswellia. Those supplements are magnificent for most conditions because they all have an anti-inflammatory effect. And I didn't mention calcium because calcium is over-supplemented. Calcium has been just jammed down people's throats at the expense of other nutrients. In fact, one of the most important minerals that we need that is not even mentioned ever is potassium. And I've got a, pot- a chapter on potassium in the book. And you really can't supplement with potassium because you need to take it with food so it breaks down and gets absorbed slowly so you don't have a, a, a cardiovascular re- response. But potassium is found in green vegetables as the most concentrated source. So potassium is actually one of the key nutrients that sits there in bony tissue and prevents bone loss. So I know I just dove off from from supplementation to potassium, but that's because people want to, they're, they're freaked out about their cholesterol levels and how much calcium they should be taking. Well, those are the exact things not to be focusing on. What to be focusing on would be like the cover of my book that shows washing away the French fries and white bread and cupcakes and desserts, replacing them with vegetables, and then add to that Multi, magnesium, fish oil, vitamin D, and if you want a probiotic, ginger, turmeric, and then CoQ10 or lipoic acid as examples. Yeah, after reading your book, I had a little bit of a different perspective on, on potassium, which was, was interesting interesting for me, and, and I hope people some people will purchase the book and read that small small chapter, but really interesting. The other the other two supplements you mentioned there that, that really interest me, one is um, the spice uh, turmeric or turmeric, however you say it, seems to have incredible health benefits. Just astounding, and, and the research out there is really heavy. And the other one is is magnesium. I mean, as a as a practitioner, I carry th- three different types of magnesium in my office. One is just a standard magnesium. Another type of magnesium that that helps people with headaches. It's a specific formulation, and another one that helps people uh, have more regular bowel movements. So magnesium, to me, is totally astounding as well. Yeah, it's actually shocking when when someone can can just take and the the, the typical dose that the average person uh, or, or or the typical recommended the dose for magnesium is about four hundred milligrams per day. Some can do more depending upon 
uh, what their what their condition is. My 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 brother suffers from cervical dystonia, real cervical dystonia, the spasmodic torticollis, and, and mm-hmm. he has taken up to two thousand milligrams of magnesium per day with no uh, diarrhea effect. And the reason why is because magnesium is 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 depleted from the body during with stressful states. So people can tolerate varying degrees of magnesium, but the average person, once they get up to 400 milligrams per day or more, they're like, I, I just, I, I feel more energy. I, I feel less depressed. I, my bowel movements are better. I'm sleeping better. I mean, it's, it's really, because it's involved with over 200, uh, 300 reactions in the human body, magnesium. No one knows that. It's always about calcium. Right, right. Now, I, I think the answer is pretty obvious, but who can benefit from your book? Well, yeah, the, it is pre- pretty obvious, really everybody. And the book is written in a fashion so that um, the, you know, I think pe- pe- people who have, uh, you need probably at least a high school ed- education to get through most of the book. There's one chapter that's a little complicated, uh, but that's just is required because you have to have a science, a science chapter. But anybody who wants to feel better and make new diet and nutrition simple because because our brains have a hard time focusing on water muddying concepts and something that is simple as inflammation is bad and drives disease we want to go the other way and deflame so this means that every time we sit down to uh, eat or drink we need to ask ourselves will this inflame me or deflame me and if you look at the foods that inflame versus deflame the choice becomes really simple yeah, I, I look at this book two ways. One, if you're just a regular health advocate, it's there are there's a couple chapters in the middle of the book that has some you know chemical structure compounds. That's a little bit tough. The rest of it's really simple. But from a clinician, I, I don't read too much research articles, unlike yourself, which I, th- I think you read a lot of research articles. But you, <laughs> there are more research articles listed in your book at the end of each chapter than I think I've seen in any book written that I've read, and I read all the time. So I, I think you, as a clinician, you can appreciate that as well about your book for sure. Well, it's important to substantiate an approach because because people have been hit with so many different dietary confusion topics it's like it's, it's it's terrible how confusing the the whole is uh, the the whole area so so since you're kind of a paleo primal guy well properly done a paleo primal diet is anti-inflammatory properly done uh atkins diet is anti-inflammatory right so if one just focuses on the the physiologic effect because you really can't like primal yourself uh, but you can deflame yourself so the terminology is, ben- is beneficial for the mind in terms of, 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 of identifying what the food choice will do in that moment and long term. Can't agree. And more. Uh, any last words, Dr. Seaman? No, I'm good. Yeah, I am too, and I think so is our audience. My name is Dr. Noah DeCoyer, your co-host, and you are listening to the Beyond Your Wildest Genes podcast. If you like what you've heard today, please share this with your friends and family and encourage them to subscribe on iTunes. Giving us a five-star rating would be the icing on the cake. Believe it or not, this helps us reach more people. You can sign up for our incredible weekly email at www.beyondyourwildestgenes.com. All the appropriate links, including our three free ebooks, can be found in the show notes. Thank you, Dr. Seaman. And as my oldest son Hayden says, be awesome and never unawesome. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>